episode 768, joined by former NFL linebacker. He's uh, Aiken Adoyo, played at Purdue University, had a great career. Not, uh, so after his NFL career, he's, he has a project going on, which we'll get to later on. But uh, I want to say thank you for joining the show today, Aiken, and how are you and your family doing and, uh, for, for, during the South situation? Uh, Nithron, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're adjusting like everybody else. It's, uh, it's been a challenge. Um, I think the one unique thing um, than most years uh, is that we're all facing the same thing at the same time, going through all the stresses, all the worries, and trying to navigate this new um, uh, situation that we're in, just with the pandemic, with opening up of businesses, um, trying to keep safe, um, you know, and trying to make different decisions and be smarter. But other than that, man, you're blessed. I'm blessed. You know, I get to see another day. Yeah. Uh, you know, I get to breathe. Uh, you know, I have a wonderful wife and a daughter um, and then just friends and family, those that you're connected to. And I think as long as you're able to find perspective in that in that manner, then, you know, you're able to see the positive and see a light. Yeah. So for you, uh, we need to get interested in, in playing football. And did you have like a role model growing up in the NFL while that you looked up to? while growing up yeah uh, I mean I'm so it's I'll, I'll try to give you a, a short condensed version because it's you know I can I, I can talk about myself when it comes to that it's easy but my condensed version is uh you know I've always been athletic that's God blessed me with some athleticism um and you know soccer was my first love swimming basketball baseball those were the sports I naturally gravitated to and I was I was good at. And then, you know, when I got to high school and I was a freshman, mm -hmm. my I, my height, I was five, six, maybe five, seven, 125 pounds. I was the smallest out of my my buddies, my friends. But I wanted to play football. I asked my mom, hey, can I play? She finally, she said, OK, go ahead. And, you know, I just started playing and I read, I remember that summer reading Sports Illustrated, Illustrated article that said high school seniors would receive scholarships or could receive scholarships to play Division One football. Mm -hmm. And really, that was the inspiration for me. I knew that education was the key. And I knew that if I could get a good, good degree, uh, if I could get a good education, that really it would open up a lot of doors. And football, you know, was that was that vessel that I could use. And you know, along the way, I just happened to, uh, well, I shouldn't say I happened to, I worked hard. I worked very hard at it. And, you know, and along the way, things just, just all came together. The, the, the puzzles, you know, the, the pieces, the pieces and puzzle all just came together. Uh, one of the things that I noticed early on that uh, it's almost like, so I went to Purdue. Yeah. And it's an, it's an engineering school. And for those who, you know, I think I thought I was going to be an engineer at one point, but realized I wasn't smart enough. But one of the basis or the foundations that you, you, you learn is input output. And at a very early age, I start to understand in high school that whatever I put in, there was going to be either a positive or negative output. And I learned the meaning of hard work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I worked, I worked very hard at it and um, happened to, you know, happened to get recognition, happened to get a lot of accolades. You know, I, uh, and I happened to play with somebody that you may have heard of in the future Hall of Famer and a guy named Drew Brees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Drew was our, our quarterback. Drew was our offensive captain. I was a defensive captain uh, at the time that we were there. And, you know, we won a lot of games. We won the Big Ten, played in the Rose Bowl, went to a bowl game every year that, uh, that I was there and got recognition and got recognized, got drafted in the third round. And, you know, things just worked out the way it was supposed to. But it, I would go back to saying it all happened because I put in a lot of time. Um, I was very disciplined, very determined. I'm the oldest of four in my family. So there's four of us, three boys and a girl, mother raised four kids by herself. And I knew that the key for me to help my family out and help myself out was going to be education. And I turned down some really good schools, some really good football schools, because I thought that if I could get a good education that way, you know, playing the NFL wasn't even in, in, in sight or part of my goal. And, but I knew that if I could get, get a good education, it would open up a lot of doors for me. And I happened to be a Cowboys fan, yeah. uh, obviously. I'm from Irving, Texas, and where the original stadium, you know, where the original stadium the Cowboys played. And, 
so I, I looked up, you know, you start, you're talking about late, uh, early 90s. I mean, the, the Emma Smiths and uh, uh, Michael Irvings and um, uh, obviously the quarterback Troy Aikman and Deion Sanders uh, thought about uh, Ken Norton Jr., who was a linebacker, you know, back then. And uh, I mean, just steady, you know, leader, uh, you know. So when I started playing linebacker, he was one of those guys I looked to. I, I was an offensive guy originally. I was a receiver slash tight end. And so, you know, I would always try to emulate, you know, Shannon Sharps and yeah. uh, Jay Novacek, you know, back then. But yeah, you know, those were the people that uh, I looked to. Yeah, so speaking of uh, family and connection, obviously you're related to Rami Adoyo too. So uh, what's it like seeing him succeed in the, when he played football? Uh, what, what was it like seeing him play football also? Oh, man. Uh, so my brother, Remy Adel, yeah. he uh, – it's a very unique story. I'll, I'll give you a quick story. So we're four years apart. Yeah. And so we really never got to – we're ever on the same um, league, uh, you know, in high school, middle school. So we never got to play together on the same team. And the cool story is uh, – there's a guy named, a coach named Bill Parcells. Yeah. And Bill, um, you know, one of my favorite coaches, um, brought Remy in, worked him out. Remy didn't get drafted. I got drafted in the third round. Remy never got drafted. He played at Oklahoma, went, went won a national, well, played in a national championship game. I think I'd be lost to Reggie Bush and USC. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, didn't get drafted. Was sitting at home. New England picked him up, cut him right before training camp or doing training camp, sitting at home six weeks. Uh, Bill brings him in for a workout, work, then comes to me and says, listen, if I sign your brother, uh, will I have problems, you know, if I cut him? I said, no, not at all. Not at all. I said, I, you know, just give him a shot if he's worth it. And if you feel, if you feel like he's, he can add value to the team, then so be it. Bill brought him in, um, worked him out him and another guy signed him, put him on the practice squad, cut him hmm. uh, probably like two weeks later. But the cool thing about Bill said, Bill, out of his own pocket, not the teams, not know the organization, Bill out of his own pocket paid for a trainer to work Remy out and to train him until he decided to bring him back. And Bill brought him back a few weeks, maybe a month, you know, a month and a half later and put him back on the practice squad. Fast forward to the next year, uh, same thing. Uh, Wade Phillips comes in. They cut Remy. Remy goes to New England. I know Remy goes to Atlanta, then comes back. And here's a, here's a story. Here's what I really want to tell you. A Sunday night game, we're playing Chicago. And um, um, we're in a huddle, Brady James and myself. And we're trying to figure out what the – we call the play. We call the defensive play. And we're t- trying to get guys in set. And in place, and we break the huddle, and I turn around and I see this big old backside. <laughs> so I'm the run in the family. Remy's bigger than me. My youngest brother Harold is bigger. I see this big old backside. I'm like, and I say to myself, "Man, that butt looks familiar. That looks like Remy's butt. You know, it looks like my brother's <laughs> butt." And you know, lo and behold, wow. it was my brother. He was in the game. You know, we're playing against Chicago and I was stuck uh, at a moment where I realized that me and my brother were in the game at the same time. And we had never, you know, one, we'd never played, you know, on the same team or league together. And then two, the fact that we're both on the field at the same time was so surreal. Uh, you know, I had, I had to catch myself. I had to snap out of it and get back in game mode. Uh, but it was my, one of my most memorable moments. And um, you know, something that I cherish just because uh, we, you know, I don't know how often that happens in, in the NFL where two brothers are in the field at the same time. And, you know, so those are the experiences, the memories that you, you remember and you, you, you live for and you cherish uh, just because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they will last forever. And, you know, for us, it was the coolest feeling, you know, mama sitting in the stands wearing the jerseys of her kid, her kids. And, you know, and especially playing for your home, home team, you know, team that you grew up, you know, watching and, you know, trying to emulate some of the players. So, yeah. That's, that's amazing. Shout out to Bill Parcells for doing that. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, obviously, you have, you guys had we had a load of defense that year with Brady James, you just said, and then Demarcus Ware was on there in that team too. And uh, we're we're going to get to all that, but I want to ask you, take me back to your recruiting process in high school. Uh, how many offers did you have other than Purdue, and what made you what made you choose Purdue? Uh, and, and yeah, so I had see all if you think about all the Big Twelve. Um, uh, Big 12 schools. So not all, but majority of them. Um, uh, OU, uh, Kansas State, Texas. UT was where I thought I was going. Um, um, UT offered me. and But then I had to go to the JC for a year. So, you know, my path wasn't direct. You know, that's another thing. I had, um, definitely had to go around and uh, take an alternative route but I still end up, you know, at the same place and then going to, cause, okay. So one, I was diagnosed with, or I was labeled ADD or at the time ADHD now, and I'm dyslexic. So I had some learning issues that I had to work through and I went to JC for a year and then coming out of JC and I had, I could have went to Miami um, and a couple of other big 10 schools, but out of high school, I chose Purdue because of the academics. Purdue to me was probably the best academic school uh, that I that offered me a scholarship. And at the time I knew nothing about Purdue, uh, especially the sports. And after researching, I realized they were a great engineering school. And that's why I used that engineering uh, um, analogy earlier, just because you know, I figured it was my best track to success, education, um, you know, everything else was secondary. Uh, and so going to Purdue uh, made made sense. I you know it's in the Midwest. I'm from the South, and I, while I was afraid to leave home, I knew there was a lot that I could gain. You know, just from being and growing, uh, being away from the family, and just really growing on my own. And it really, I don't know where that thought or wisdom came, but it'll, I would say it's probably the best thing that I ever did was leaving home and being out on my own and figuring things out. Because one thing it taught me, it taught me how to survive. It taught me how to take risk and how to assess risk. Um, you know, it, it taught me how to push and be disciplined. And it gave me a thirst and hunger just to uh, pursue success, uh, pursue achievements. And so I could take care of those that I loved, you know, the most. And I'm forever, I'm glad that I did. I tell people all the time, I grew up in, in, West Lafayette, Indiana. I, you know, I became a man in West Lafayette, Indiana. The Midwest was very different. <laughs> okay, the people in Midwest were very different. And if you think about, I'm, I'm clean shaven now and all this. I, I used to have a lot of hair, but back then, I wore I had what four hoop earrings on this side and three on this side, and I had all this hair. And I would wear my hat and the, the brim all the way down so you could barely see my eyes. And so people would always look at me weird, like, who is this guy, you know? Who is this guy? And, you know, I would always get people staring at me. And, but come to find out, Midwesterners are probably the most laid back, cool people. And I just um, uh, made so many good relationships and friends up there and uh, I really cherish my time up there too. So uh, what was it what was it like playing with the guy like Drew, you, you just mentioned Drew Brees and obviously Anthony Spencer. Uh, but what, tell, tell me about playing with Drew Brees and Purdue because – and when did you guys start realizing that he can be that potential Hall of Famer in the NFL? Oh, we knew early on. Drew was very competitive. Drew, um, you know, I don't drink, but we would, we would go out and, you know, they would play ping pong. They would play beer bong. They would play darts. They would play Pac-Man. I mean, whatever it was, Drew was in it to win it. He wasn't taking, he wasn't trying to take second place for nobody. Um, and you know, then you watch his habits on the field. You know, Drew was always out, you know, probably a good 30, 40 minutes before everybody else got to the field, warming up, getting his arm ready and working on his accuracy. Uh, we had this net that was in our field house, in our indoor facility where it had squares and Drew would go 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards, you know, all the way back to probably like 50, 60 yards and trying to hit the center of all these squares on this net. And, and just, you just saw his discipline 
and his commitment, you know, into being a professional, uh, his leadership, um, you know, those things came out early. So it wasn't so much, uh, it wasn't so much that, you know, if he was going to be in Hall of Fame, it was when he was going to be in Hall of Fame, you know, when he decided to walk out. And game day, he showed up every week. Um, he showed up every week. You know, defensively, we knew all we had to do was just get him the ball. Like, get the offense the ball. That was our that was our motto. That was our goal. Get the offense the ball at all costs, you know, and that's what we would do. And so we knew if we could get them the ball, they would make magic happen. So obviously you said earlier that you were a tight end and a receiver. Did you ask the coach, can I, can I be a receiver one day so I can get the ball from Drew Brees during the game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. But we had a, a uh, all Big Ten tight end named Tim Stratton, who actually won the first, what is that? Is it the Mackey Award uh, in college for best tight end? Um, and he, 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 he was a phenomenal, uh, tight end receiver. It wasn't the best blocker, but could catch. And I actually got to play tight end at Purdue some, huh. but it wasn't Drew that threw me the ball. It was Kyle Orton that threw oh, me wow. the ball. <laughs> yeah. So I got, a, I got, a, I got a little two way action. Nice. Um, so obviously Drew Brees announced his retirement. Uh, did you reach out to him when he, when he announced it? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, we stayed in, we stayed connected, stayed in contact over the years. And, and that's one thing about, you know, just the friendship of playing with guys and really getting to know them that uh, when you have that connection, you have those memories, you know, uh, uh, you get to, uh, all, you can always revisit the friendship, you know, no matter the time lapse. But, you know, we stayed connected and, you know, he said appreciate it and he's looking forward to the next chapter of his life. So now I want to talk to talk, take me back to your draft experience. Obviously, you got, you got drafted in two thousand two, round three, picked eighty nine, from the Jacksonville Jaguars. What was that feeling like? Waiting for the, for your name to be, be to be called, uh, wait, uh, and then <laughs> being with your family. And what was what's a, what's that feeling like when you got your name called? Um, well, one, I wasn't with my family. I was in a hotel room by oh, myself. Wow. Yeah, but it was it was my choice. You know, all my friends wanted me to throw a party and you know do this big big festive you know event. And I was like, and I said no. That morning, Remy had or that day, Remy was having his prom in high school. He was a senior, and so I, I got him ready, got him a limo, and you know, sent him off with him and his friends. And my mom asked me what I wanted to do. I, I just said I just wanted to relax and. You know, because prior to that, there's a lot that happened. It's all the workouts. I got invited to the combine. I played in the senior bowl. I traveled and met all these coaches. And I, I honestly, at that point, I was worn out and I just wanted to relax. And so I got me a hotel room and sat in the hotel room and I watched the first two rounds. And I was projected to go between second and fifth round. So I was prepared to watch all the way up, to, all, all the way up to then. And um, I get a call from a 904 number hmm. and I pay that. So I, I pick it up. And then as soon as I pick it up, I get a call from a New York number. And then I get another call from a, a, uh, a Miami number. So I could have went to either one of those teams, but I get a call from um, Tom Coughlin, you know, asking me, you know, uh, how do I feel about becoming a Jaguar? I said, I would love to be a Jaguar. And he said, okay, we're look out. Your name is about to come up on the screen. And as soon as that happened, we hung up. I called my mom and she was already screaming. She was like, I know, I know. I drove home and we, we celebrated. Hmm. So what made you decide to, obviously uh, you stayed in a hotel. Uh, what, you, uh, being, so what, what, was it, what, what was that decision like being in a hotel by yourself, not with your family? No, it was it was my choice. I really was just worn out. I had you know, from I went from playing in a, in a bowl game on December 30th or 31st mm -hmm. to going straight to flying straight to San Francisco and started training for the combine. And then, you know, midway through training, I had to go play in a senior bowl, um, which then is all the. Uh, you know, the tests that you have to do there, the practices, the coaches pulling you left and right. And then I went from there back to training. Then I had the, the combine. Then I had my pro day. 
Um, you know, after the pro day, then I had the meetings with, with teams. It, it was a lot. You know, it was just a lot. And most people don't understand the, the stress and the energy that you have to pour out every single day. And in that moment, you know, I had a choice. I could celebrate with everybody or I could just relax and recover. And I just wanted to relax and recover because I knew the very next weekend I was off. I was off to whatever team had picked me up and we had our first rookie camp and I just needed a moment. And, you know, that moment was, I think, probably four at the time. At that time, you know, the first three rounds were in the first day. Hmm. So I think I lasted maybe five hours before I got picked. Um, and that five hours was worth just relaxing. And but I got to celebrate with my family, you know, once I the pick, I went home. Uh, it was a 20 minute drive. I went home, hung out with my mom, my siblings, and it was awesome. It was an awesome feeling. Yeah, so you spent three years in Jacksonville. So what was it like playing in front of those fans and the warm weather in that stadium? And what and what was it what was the most important thing that you learned in Jacksonville while playing there? Um you know, the, the Jaguar fans, one, one thing I, I noticed that they were uh, at the time probably just as loyal to the college teams <laughs> and, and then the NFL teams. Uh, but the, the, the people that came and showed up, the people that came and showed up were awesome. I mean, they were true lore fans. And I fell in love with Jacksonville right away. Um, the organization, um, you know, was fantastic, was uh, first class, uh, the, uh, the, the, the staff, um, you know, one, one, one coach who also had a huge influence on me was uh, Jack Del Rio. Uh, you know, Jack was a former linebacker uh, slash defensive coordinator. So he, we spent a lot of time together and I, I learned to play NFL style defense um, and linebacker style, NFL style linebacker in Jacksonville because of coaches like Jack Del Rio um, and, you know, him helping me. The one thing about my situation, and it's a gift and a curse, I was athletic enough to play multiple positions. I was fast enough to play multiple positions. And, um, you know, I, I was strong enough to play several positions. So in college, I would always go back and forth between defensive end and linebacker, depending on the game that we played. I got drafted as a linebacker, but even so, my first three years in the league, I would start a linebacker, but then, you know, third down, sometimes I would see myself playing rush defensive end. And Jack, you know, me and Jack spent a lot of time together. Him wanted me to learn the niche and the the, the, the skill aspect of being a linebacker and then the mental aspect of being a linebacker. And so I just, you know, my, from my fourth year on, I really just focus on just really playing linebacker and because I really want to be the best linebacker that I could be. And just that time in Jacksonville with Jack was, was huge for my career. Hmm. So uh, before we get to the Cowboys and all, um, I'm just curious, was it tough for you uh, moving from team to team um, obviously NFL is a business and, uh, for, for you, but how, how did you adapt from moving from team to team? Oh, you do. It, it wasn't tough at all. And one thing, just what you said, um, uh, is it's a business. And, you know, when you're in the business, you, you learn that you have to be adaptable and you have to be flexible in how the manner or the way the business flows. And most players, you just, um, and you just, you know, once once that decision has been made, whether it's through a trade or it's through free agency, um, you just move forward with it, you know. And I, I will say we're we're privileged that, uh, and we have the finance to where we can we can transfer our material things, our goods. You know, we can either hire somebody to take care of it for us. Um, you know, we can hire a realtor to help us find a place. You can hire a, a, a moving carrier to shift our furniture. Um, I didn't have to worry about moving with a family. I wasn't married. Um, you know, I didn't have kids. So I know how it can take a toll on your family. Uh, and so I never had to worry about that. But I saw, you know, I saw that, you know, with teammates that were married and had kids and that aspect I think would be would be the difficult part because you know kids having to change schools and you know if your wife worked or you know or leaving her friends behind but for the most part it wasn't difficult mm -hmm. so 
So I know you like, mm-hmm. I know that you played with the Dolphins, Broncos, and Bills, but I want to get to America's team. Uh, obviously, uh, what was that feeling like? Obviously, you were a Cowboys fan growing up, being from there and being able to put the star on your – I mean, the helmet uh, <clears throat> the helmet with the star and playing with your brother and playing with great teammates, a, a great coaching staff. What was that feeling like just being in Dallas and playing there? It was – there was – and you know, I used to imagine when I was younger – uh, if how cool it would be, you know, to play for America's team. I used to picture myself wearing a star and I used to picture myself, I, I thought I'd be a running back or receiver at the time, like going up with the ball, running with the ball, we're catching the ball. And so when the opportunity came around, which was also a, a Bill Parcells deal, um, and I, he's one of the best salesmen too, because I actually had an opportunity to sign with two other teams. And then Bill came, came call, call in and Jerry Jones came call in. And so, you know, I listened and obviously, you know, it didn't take much of uh, uh, negotiating or twisting my arm, but it was definitely for me, it, it, it cemented my, um, the, all the hard work I put into prior, you know, into uh, playing for the boys, um, all the, the, the dreams and the goals and, um, you know, I tell not a lot of people know this, but I used to sneak into the old Cowboy Stadium uh, when I was in college. I'd come home and I would run every single stairs, I'd go around and sprint every single stairs. And at the end of my workouts, I would stand there and just picture myself in that stadium. And, you know, it, it, it really, and that's what we say. It's like your dreams, you can manifest um, a lot of your vision and your goals uh, just by um, the, the way you imagine the things that you say to yourself, the words that you speak out loud. And I was able to do that, you know, just from how it all came around. And so it was huge. It, it was, I was excited. My family work was excited because I had spent, I think prior to that, nine years away from being in Texas. Um, so my mom, my siblings, and all my friends that I grew up with, and gi- giving them the the memories, right? Giving them um, opportunities to they can come to the games and actually see somebody that they're actually connected to. To me, that meant a lot. You know, that was my gift. Also, it w- it wasn't just about my dream, but it's also my gift to those that I cared about and those that I I, I knew and I was connected to. Obviously, we were surrounded by great players on defense. You had Marcus Spears, Demarcus Ware, Terrence Newman, Roy Williams. Um, <laughs> you, you Greg named Ellis, yeah, um, Chris Cora, Canty, Bobby, uh, Bobby. Jason Ferguson. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all these guys, you know, you can think of that, you know, there, there wasn't a weak spot on our defense. I mean, even the guys that, you know, were second or backed us up, you know, those guys could have went on any team and started. You're talking about the Kevin Burnett, who went off to yeah. San Diego and Miami, uh, Bobby Carpenter. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Like all these guys that, you know, Keith Davis, uh, all these guys that just were phenomenal players. So when you came to practice, <laughs> you brought your A game. Practice was so much harder than actual games because all these guys that I, we just named off and a lot more, I mean, we're so professional, so athletic, so passionate about what they did and, you know, what we were trying to accomplish as a team that it made practice fun. It made practice hard, but it made practice fun. Uh, I think you're, if you haven't yet, or you're about to interview um, Andre Garrard. Yeah, Thursday. He's, he's one of the most, he was one of the most athletic, unassuming offensive linemen uh, that you will ever meet because uh, he could play either either guard position and center was fast enough to to run and agile enough to go either way and to get up to the second level was as strong as if not one of the strongest you know linemen that you'll ever meet but you go against guys like that you know Flozell Adams yeah you know so when you get that, I'm naming guys that when you have to go against them, if you don't bring your A game, you were going, you were on your back, uh, you know, getting pancaked and, you know, and, 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 and looking bad on film. And that's one thing you don't want to do is look bad on film. 
So yeah, it was a that was a phenomenal time. Um, it was a great time to be to be a cowboy and to you know wear that helmet and you know to play with those guys. You know, Demarcus Ware. You just talked about Demarcus Ware. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, so there there's several guys that you play with. I mean, I probably played with over a thousand guys I played with, you know, as teammates. And, you know, I think of about three guys that I could say, you know, just phenomenal freak of nature, you know, the athletes that it's only once in a lifetime, once in a generation type deal. Uh, two of the three didn't make it to the NFL. Hmm. And the one that made it to the NFL that I we're talking about is DeMarcus Ware. Um, you know, he's, he's six, four, six, three, six, four, you know, at the time he's probably, he's probably 255, maybe 260. Okay. And check this out. He, DeMarcus Ware is as fast as the fastest man on the field at that size. He's as quick and agile as the quickest, smallest guy on the field. And he's as strong as the strongest offensive lineman, defensive lineman on the field. Mm. So you have that combination and then you add your dazzle on top of that, some of the athleticism, you know, this guy could do anything he wanted, you know, and uh, just to say that I played with a guy like that, you know, is, is an honor. Uh, speaking of not only defense, but look at the offense you played with, Tony Romo, Terrell Owens, Sam Hurd, Miles Austin, Mayor, Marion Barber, Corey Proctor. Like you said, the offensive line, offensive line was stacked. Corey Proctor. Uh, was that was it like seeing, as a defense seeing the offense go out go at it? Oh, you know, Mark Colombo. Yeah, uh, Mark Colombo. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and that was a deal. So you know, offensively, I mean, we defensively, it was a bad tool. You know, we. We're, we're hammering each other, giving each other a hard time, talking trash to each other, you know, pushing each other. Then all season, when we worked out, you know, we were just, everything was 100%. And I think that's why, you know, you, you, we saw the successes, you know, that, you know, when the one year we were 13 and yeah. three, you know, and even the previous year that we played and lost to Seattle, uh, you know, um, with the Romo fumble on the, on the uh, field goal, you know, that was a, another phenomenal team, you know. They, so just all across the board, you know, you just, there was talent everywhere. And, you know, uh, I, I believe either we had nine or 11 pro bowlers, mm -hmm. you know, in that span. So that's a lot to say from one team. Yeah, I had uh, actually, I, um, I had Martin Gramatica on the show last year. Uh, he, he was on there, yeah. Yeah, I had him on the show uh -huh. last year. He had, a, he had a great career also, obviously Super Bowl. The Super Bowl champ, and but um, for you, uh, looking back at your career, over 600 tackles, over 10 sacks, and how great are you to be in this position? Um, also, you were a two-time second team All Big Ten, also in your college career. So, how great are you to be in this position, position to be able to play the game that you love, play with great teammates throughout your career, and uh, learn from awesome coaches? Uh, um, no, it was great, you know. And my senior year in college, I, uh, you know, was first team all Big Ten. Um, you know, I had, I had seasons where just depending, you know, I could have been, I, you know, I was on the bubble being a pro bowler. Um, I, um, you know, had plenty of recognition in me. I was a, I was, you know, played, you know, close to a decade in National Football League. I was a starter from the second game of my rookie year. Uh, until I walked out, you know, um, years later. And, you know, while all those things I just named and accolades and, um, and starts are great, you know, the things that I cherish the most are the, the friendships that I, you know, gotten, I got from playing, you know, talking about Brady James, you know, I'm the godfather of his kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we communicate, you know, every week, you know, and DeMarcus Ware, you know, we're, we're as close, you know, as friends can be, you know, we talk all the time, we check up on each other. And, you know, these coaches, like I got a chance to talk to Bill Parcells last week uh, for my teammates, you know, just being the respect that I got from teammates and other um, players in the league that recognized that you, the media may have not recognized me as an elite guy or this 
outstanding you know performer but the respect and the recognition you get from teammates and other colleagues that are in the league you know to me that went a you know a lot further and 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 you I respect more and that those are the things that I take from my time in the league you know I, I take the time where I had to learn to grow up and you know become a man in the sense of having to take care of business, showing up every single day, no matter what life circumstances that I'm, you know, you're going through off the field, but knowing that, you know, once you walk in through the door, you know, you put on, you take off the life hat and you put on the professional hat um, and the football hat and what that entails, you know, I, I take away the memories. I got to play with my brother, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and uh, on the field at the same time, on the same team, I got to watch him go off to New Orleans and win a Super Bowl with my college quarterback. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. You know, I got to provide for my mom and my siblings and myself, and put myself in the position, you know, that financially, you know, that you know, I, I am able to take care of myself and those that I love. Uh, you know, things like that. You know, I think most people don't realize the opportunity. And even fans itself, that what guys get from being a professional, it's cool to have friends and to have fans that celebrate you. But the, the intangibles, the memories, the um, uh, um, you know the time spent, all those things go a long a long ways and mean a lot more to a lot of players. To me, uh, as a Cowboy fan, we obviously we watch you play a lot. You brought it 100 percent on the field. To me, you had a great career, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, but now, obviously, after your NFL career, um, you, you've been, you guys have been working on a project. Um, so what's that experience, experience been like? And I see you post uh, quotes every morning, motivational quotes just to help people every morning. So well, explain about that project you've been doing. Yeah, well, you know, so a couple of things. I'm, I have several things going. Uh, <clears throat> I um, professionally, um, I just took a role as a, an executive at an insurance company um, in, in um, it's called, my company's name is called World Insurance. Um, and so that's, that's a new uh, uh, opportunity for myself and my family. I, you know, after I finished playing ball, I went to grad school, got my MBA, went to New York, worked for uh, a, a wealth management private equity company, started my own wealth management private equity company. And that's what I've been doing all, you know, for the last six years, seven years. And an opportunity came for me to transition. And so I saw a chance for me again to grow, to, to adapt, to learn. And, and they saw a lot of value in what I've done in, my, in the last six years and thought that it would, you know, um, create opportunities and add value in, in their business. And so, you know, that's my transition now. When it comes to the, the positive quotes and the motivational, that's something that just comes natural. I, I, I've always had a mindset for growth. I've always had a mindset for positivity. Um, I'm a man of faith. So that's something that guides me every single day. That's something I wake up to. And all in all, it's about helping people think differently. It's about helping people who are in circumstances, situations, adjust their perspective. And if I can, if it helps one person out of all the people that follow me, you know, I feel that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a time worthwhile. I just came from a weekend where um, we had to lay my, one of my college mentors to rest. Hmm. And, you know, it was an emotional weekend, but you know, why I am the way I am and why I post the things that I post and my foundation, Dream Builders um, Foundation has done, you know, work since 2006 uh, that help kids and youth, um, you know, all across. We're in 32 NFL, all 32 NFL cities. We've done um, some initiative in those cities. You know, we've worked with uh, countless of professional athletes, um, NFL, NBA, MLB, right. but all those things are about giving back, giving back time and giving yourself. And I think what most people um, would say that if, if you're consistent, if you're present, and if you lead with love, you know, most people, nine out of 10 times, will be open to receive. Uh, whether it's kids, whether it's adults, uh, whether it's in the business world, 
I believe that most, most everybody uh, will receive and be willing to help in some way. And this is what we do. This is what I do. Um, you know, I, I, I do my best to be consistent. Um, I do my best to be present when I'm in a situation or I'm talking to somebody. And I do my best to always lead with love. You know, we're not all perfect, but I think if, you, if your effort and your intentions are there, uh, people will receive. Yeah, so sorry for your loss, by the way. Oh no, thank you. Um, it's uh, he had, you know, he had a wonderful career. So Leroy Keys, if you ever get a chance, mm -hmm. look up Leroy Keys, Marvin Leroy Keys. He was a two-time consensus All-American. He was second in the Heisman, I think, in '67. Oh, wow. um, he was he played defense and offense in college. In the league, he played in the NFL. Um, he I think he he played some offense, but ended up being a safety. Uh, for Philadelphia and Kansas City, um, and then, you know, went on to be the, an activist, and then went on to, um, he went back to West Lafayette to Purdue, and uh, just became a, a champion for the, for the university and an ambassador. So he was just one of those people who had, who had an impact on everybody that he interacted with. I never met a stranger, always had a smile on his face. He was one of the first people, so Leroy Keys. Tony Romo and Terrence Newman were one of the people that put a golf club in my hand. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, I fell in love with golf. Wow. Uh, so a couple more things here before I let you go. All right. How's your golf game, by the way? It's not bad. It's, a, you know, the pandemic. I haven't had a chance to play as much. Uh, and uh, I had, we have a nine month old daughter. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, things, uh, 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 my time has shifted from what I would normally play five, six hours on the golf course to spending time with my daughter and my wife. Uh, but, you know, I'm probably a 10 handicap right now. I was, I was a lot lower uh, pre-pandemic, but I'm probably a 10 handicap right now. Yeah, so a couple of quick hit questions here. So obviously the draft is on Thursday, um, and we have the 10th pick, the Cowboys. Um, they can go in either direction. So if you if you were in Jerry Jones Jerry Jones position and Stephen Jones and Will McClay, what uh, mm -hmm. what would you what would you do with the ten pick? Because everybody uh, there's a name that's been uh, rising up the board, Micah Parsons from Penn State. If he's there, would he take him or would he take Patrick's return? Who who do you like? Who do you like for the Cowboys at ten? Um, I, I I honestly I think they have to go defense. Mm -hmm. The defense build young, uh, stack up the defense. I think offensive with Dak coming back, I think I believe does change the dynamic of the offense and that too. It'll be more consistent. And you know, as long I, I believe right now they're get a chance to for him to practice and get his timing back. And if they can keep him protected with the offensive line, and which we have a, more veterans on the offensive side, I would say go defense. And I like Satane. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a huge fan of his dad. I thought he had I, I I believe he had a stellar college career. And I believe when it comes to this league right now, um, it's a passing league, you know, and you need defenders uh, on the edge that can uh, cover these phenomenal, you know, athletes and receivers that are out there. So I would definitely say, you know, uh, go with the cornerback. Hmm. Um, would you consider being a coach? Uh, if the right opportunity presents itself, would you consider being a coach in the NFL or college? I've had opportunities. I had opportunities this offseason. Uh, I've had opportunities from the time I walked out the game. No, I would not consider being a coach. <laughs> I would not consider being a coach. I would say the one group of people that worked harder than NFL players are coaches. Hmm. Um, there's a, there's a, one of my former coaches, um, I won't say his name because uh, a lot of people, he, he has a famous name. Said, said this to me um, when he was coaching me. He said, uh, he said, the one thing I regret is that I'm a Sunday dad. And that the only time I see my child, especially during the season, is on Sundays after the games. Because Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, when I get home, he's asleep. When I wake up and go to work, he's asleep. Hmm. And, you know, I think I, I, for, for me, you know, I, I, I work hard, you know, what I do now, but I want to be around. I want my daughter uh, yeah. to see me and know me and have a chance uh, for me to have an impact in her life. So hmm. I'm choosing that to be a coach. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, the last two things here, um, our team is part of the uh, foundation called Hugh Jackson Foundation. Obviously, he's a former NFL coach, but he, he just got an offensive coordinator job with uh, Tennessee State. He's, he's part of the Eddie George staff now. Um, so uh, Wait, 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 wait. Eddie George is, is coaching? Yeah, he's a head coach for Tennessee State now. Shut the door. Where have I been? When H did this happen? HBCU school. Uh, I think uh, two weeks ago. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations. I have to hit him up. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Hugh Jackson's part of that te uh, team now as an offensive coordinator, but Jeff Fisher's on the board too. And um, we're part of their foundation. We're trying to help them prevent human trafficking and making sure the kids stay safe, the community stay safe, and it's so horrible out there. And we're really grateful to be part of his foundation. It's really inspiring. So I'll send you that page so you can check it out. And um, the last thing here, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and essential workers right now? Yeah, you know, I, I think anybody, I think everybody who has had to sacrifice, you know, themselves to be in the front lines during this pandemic, um, you know, I think you, across the board, the grocery workers, uh, um, store, um, the doctors, the nurses, um, you know, you think about all the ancillary businesses that had to open because to keep us um, having product uh, or food. Um, so, you know, just say thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm sorry that we can't all be on the same message, on the same line when it comes to protecting each other. But, you know, we thank you for your sacrifice and, and just thank you for all that you've done to keep us and getting us closer, you know, to normal, uh, normal society. So there it is. That wraps up episode 768 with former NFL linebacker Aiken Adoyle. He also played for Purdue University. He's doing some great things now off the field with his foundation. And um, But I just want to say thank you for joining the show today. It was truly an honor. Um, I learned a lot today from this interview. Keep up the great work. Uh, you and your family stay safe. And we would like to have you back as a returning guest at some point so you can meet the full team. Okay. I appreciate it, buddy. You have a good day. Thank you.